My grandmother was a God-fearing woman. She was in her late 80s when she told me this story and she swore on the Bible that it was true. My grandmother and grandfather were newlyweds. They had spent the first few months living with her parents until they could find a home to rent. My grandfather was the pastor of a small country church down Sycamore Avenue. He didn't make much money preaching and many of his congregation members couldn't give money to the church. So they brought chickens and corn on the cob and eggs to the preacher. With limited income, finding a home was challenging. One Sunday, a church member came up to my grandfather after church and told him that his aunt had a house that she was trying to rent, wanted to know if he wanted to rent it. The house was a two-story white home with a big picture window in the living room. The kitchen was on the main floor and two bedrooms were upstairs. The house was nice, and it was cheap, only $10 a month. Well, why is it so cheap, my grandmother asked the owner of the home. Well, I can't lie to a preacher, but the house is haunted, he said. Well, my grandparents were shocked and shook their heads because they didn't believe in ghosts. The only ghost that we believe in is the Holy Ghost, said my grandfather. Okay, said the owner, but I warned you. He said this with a nervous laugh. My grandparents moved in all day and finally got settled. Nothing happened the first night, but that was the last peaceful night's sleep they would have in that house. The next night began normal. Grandpa and Grandma went up to the bedroom and went to sleep. At 2 a.m., they heard people talking down in the kitchen. Several people, in fact. They heard the cabinets being opened and dishes being set on the table. The kitchen chairs were heard moving across the floor. My grandfather got a shotgun and quietly walked down to the stairs. He turned on the light and there was nothing, nothing out of place. The kitchen was perfectly clean and in order just like Grandma left it. Grandpa searched the house and he still found nothing. And then he remembered the owner's words. It's haunted. A cold chill came over him. He quickly prayed the Lord's Prayer and checked both the front and back doors to see that they were locked. He then went up to bed, and only to have the same thing happen. The voices started and the dishes started to be moved about the kitchen. Grandpa finally went to the kitchen and turned the light on. Everything stopped. He put his Bible open to Psalm 91 on the table, and he went to sleep with his head resting on the book. The next morning, my grandmother told him she wanted to leave. She didn't want to live in a haunted house. Grandpa told her they would pack up and leave, and they did just that. It took most of the day, but with the help of family members, they had everything out of the house in one day. My grandparents shut the curtains on the massive front picture window in the living room and quietly looked left and right, and again they felt a cold chill come into the room. They quickly walked out the front door and locked it. As they slowly pulled out of the driveway, my grandmother yelled, Stop! My grandfather stopped and they looked at the house and the curtains they had closed upon leaving were slowly opening. My grandparents looked at each other and said, It's haunted! They left and the house sat empty for many years after that. The writer of this story would like to be anonymous. She claims the story is true. I was a college student in rural Tennessee in the mid-1980s. The campus is on a plateau in the Blue Ridge Mountains and has been there since the Civil War. There are 10,000 acres of woods with the buildings all clustered together and we were 30 minutes from the nearest Walmart and hours from a big city. There are lakes and caves and waterfalls, and I'd grown up in a congested area, so this place was a dream come true. I attended one session of summer school in 1985. Class was over at noon most days, and it was hot. At lunch on one of those days, my friend Jane and I decided to go swimming out at a lake where we didn't have to wear bathing suits. We did it partly to cool down because it was so hot, but mostly to be wild, free, and brave in our own little way. 
No one ever went to this lake. Jane and I discovered why as we stepped in and sunk deep into the mucky bottom. We were standing there up to our knees in the murky water, swatting at flies, trying to pull our feet out of the suctioning mud, and laughing at the gigantic failure our swimming venture had become, when a silver craft appeared over the tree line across the lake. It looked like the classic 1950s flying saucer. It moved from right to left, neither fast nor slow, and then stopped right in the middle of my field of view. It hovered in place for what was probably only a minute, but it felt much longer. I remember it seemed to vibrate. It's hard to describe. It was just almost imperceptible vibrations, but with absolutely no other noise. Well, Jane and I were dumbstruck. We were naked and afraid, but without the camera crew to film it. The bottom of the lake was the closest thing to quicksand I hoped to ever stand in. We snapped out of our shock and started clumsily trying to get back to the bank. I was trying to keep my eye on the saucer without falling down, while at the same time pulling each foot from the deep muck and then sinking it back in another step closer to the bank. As we tried to run away, the saucer zipped off in the direction it was already heading, and then it accelerated to an incredibly high speed and disappeared from sight. We were in such a hurry to escape, we jumped into Jane's car, still covered in muck from our knees down. She was and still is such a tidy person. We kept saying how weird it was and that it was a UFO, and we agreed not to tell anyone because they wouldn't believe us, and worse, they would gossip about us being crazy or weird. I recently learned that Bigfoot has been spotted in that area. I've talked to Jane about that day, and we both get wide-eyed thinking about it. The hovering maneuver, the silence, and the high speed at which it left convinced us that it was no normal technology. We both feel like it was going about its business when it spotted us and observed us naked earthlings for a minute and then made up for lost time getting out of there. It's funny because we picked that lake hoping no one on earth would spot us, and in a way... I guess we succeeded. Twice more in my life, I have seen UFOs. Both were in Northern California, and both times I was sober and with a friend. The sightings were three years apart. Sadly, it's been decades since I've seen one. One UFO chased my friend and me as we sped off in our rental car. There was no Bigfoot connection there, but if you're interested in the story, let me know. Of course, ma'am. Of course we're interested. Please send them. Thanks for a great resource for all of us who are curious about and open to the strange possibilities of our galaxy. The writer's name is Peter. The topic is paranormal activity, and he claims the story is true. I grew up in the 1970s in a place called Wilton Village on the outskirts of the city of Liverpool in the United Kingdom. My parents lived for the weekends when they would go off to their cottage. At the time, I had Saturday morning school to attend, so I was left at home under the supervision of my siblings, who didn't want to go to the cottage in Wales away from their group of teenage friends. The arrangement suited everyone well, except me. I hated school. Walton Village is notable for one thing. It was made of the same sandstone blocks excavated from the quarry that gave its name to the pop group, the Quarrymen. They morphed into the Beatles, and I'm sure everyone has heard of them. Their first performance was at St. Peter's Church Village Hall. The house we lived in was named after the French Alps. This was appropriate since it resembled a mountain of sandstone blocks sourced from the aforementioned quarry. It was built on the edge of Reynolds Park. For some reason, the park owners would not allow any windows to overlook the park. This meant the top story was always dark and atmospheric. My older siblings and I did not like to go up to the top floor. I was frequently awakened in the night by my bed shaking, even being tipped out on occasion. 
drawers in my room would fly open during the night, and I would get a row for being untidy the next morning. I learned to shut my eyes and say the Lord's Prayer until it stopped and I was able to go back to sleep. My parents were professionals, and so we eventually had babysitters come and help look after us. They had to sleep in a room at the top of the house. None of them stayed long, and I never knew why. As we got older, my older brother and sister used to sneak up to the vacated room and open the window that faced away from the park for an illicit smoke and to listen to some pop music. One night, they started hearing noises in the adjoining room. My brother turned the music down, and he listened more closely. The room was a little more than a corridor and a storeroom through which they had to pass to get to the room they were in, the room that they would have to pass through to get back downstairs. Initially, they wrote it off as nothing more than old cupboards or drawers settling or the floor creaking. They turned the music back up and tried to forget about it. The noises became more frequent and louder until they could hear drawers being pulled open and shut with a slam that actually shook the wall adjacent to their room. Paul, my older brother, decided it must be a burglar, so he summoned his courage and threw open the door and switched on the light and he shouted, Who's there? There was no one there, just an unearthly chill in the air. Two floors below, I was lounging in a chair watching Saturday night TV. At my side was our family dog. I was 13, and he was my best friend. We were very close. I knew his every mood and could read him like a book. He woke from his sleep and his hackles rising, a sure sign that he was scared. He started a low growl that quickly turned into the bark of alarm. He jumped in front of my armchair and began circling a spot in the carpet, lunging and snapping as if he were attacking someone that I couldn't see. I was terrified and aware of how cold the room had become. Suddenly I heard thunderous footsteps running down the stairs and my brothers burst into the room, followed closely by my sister. The dog stopped and went to greet them. They were full of what had happened upstairs and excitedly talking to each other, making it difficult to understand them. They never did tell me why they rushed into my room. Maybe it was because of the dog's noise. As time moved on, I left school and started at the local technical college, hoping to gain an entry to university. Two Saturdays into the first term, I invited some of my new friends to come back to the house after visiting the local pub. My parents were always absent at the weekend, and my older siblings had fledged and left home, so the house became a regular venue, and I was happy for the company. I left the pub early one night to turn on the house lights and lock away the dog in preparation for my friend's arrival, and I cranked up the old large record player that was housed in a monstrous wooden cabinet, and I boiled the kettle. And then I set out some playing cards and biscuits in anticipation of a good card game. A car slowed down in the road outside and the dog started barking. I thought it had pulled off the road and into the drive, but that was out of my sight behind the garage, which had once been a stable block. The dog quieted down, but the college friends never arrived. The following Monday, when I saw them, they were all giving me strange looks. At the first break time, I met them in the college canteen and asked what had happened to them. One tall lad, who I knew least of all, had been the driver for the others. He came across to me and he said, Look, I'm sorry, but I can never go into your house. Okay, I said, what's the problem? There was just silence. He stared at me. He looked at his feet and said, I have to go to my class now, and he left. Well, I was confused and no one would talk about it. As the years passed, I started at the university away from my home in Birmingham. One of my home friends was throwing a party and I decided to travel back to attend and catch up with some people. Jacqueline, who was to become my wife, she came with me. It was a rare occasion to find my parents at home for the weekend, so Jacqueline stayed at my sister's room and I slept in the other end of the corridor in my room. 
It was a good party, and we crept back into the house late, trying not to set off the dog and wake my parents. We slept late. The next morning, I was surprised when Jackie wanted to know who the old man was who kept coming into her room. He had on a black frock coat and a top hat. And when she eventually met my sister, they could both describe the same man. My sister said she thought he had passed on. Many events happened in that house, and I eventually learned that Sandy, the driver who fled from my drive, was embarrassed to admit that his mother was a medium, something he had always scoffed at. However, the night he pulled up to my house, for the first time he saw that it was full of spirits and had to admit that he could sense them too. He didn't want to appear weird amongst his newfound college friends, so he had not talked about it. After university, I found work in the local area, and my parents sold the house and retired to their cottage. I was intrigued to meet the family who moved in. I didn't ask if they'd had any strange experiences, but they didn't stay there long. I often see the house has once more come up for sale. This story is titled, Hunting the Wendigo. The author's name is Jeremy, and he claims this story is true. This is something I can't explain. It is something of old and of Indian folklore that most people never encounter, and I pray they never do. I came in from outside looking at the full moon last week, which brought back the fear that I thought was gone, but I was wrong. After spending the last 10 years altering my life and habits, sometimes locked up in the house, I hope that writing this will be the release I need to let this go. It was not the nightmares of the war in Afghanistan, but the hell I went through when I got home. The IED roadside bombs and my friends who were injured or killed doesn't make for peaceful dreams. But the ordeal I'm about to tell you it's just as bad. I returned home in November of 2009. There were two days left in the season in Ohio. Before the Marine Corps, I loved to deer hunt, and I needed to reconnect with the old habits and the things I loved before the war. I got up early that morning and hot-footed it out to the Wayne National Forest before dawn. It was a nasty day with cold rain and fog that hung low to the ground. Nothing was moving, not even the squirrels. Even the local wildlife had a better sense than to be out in this stuff. They were bundled up somewhere drier out of the weather, and here I was shivering and soaked to the bone. By 4 p.m. I'd had enough and I hopped back in the truck and I headed home. I was traveling down a narrow two-lane road, and as I was making my way around a long curve, I saw there, about 250 yards away, the largest buck I had ever seen. Well, I pulled over and I watched him mill about the pasture. He was remarkable. The next day was Sunday, and I repeated the trip again with no sign of any whitetail, so I loaded up and headed back home empty-handed. As I approached the curve, I slowed way down, and to my delight, I saw the same buck there. But he was acting strange. He was stomping something on the ground. The giant buck appeared to be in a rage. I couldn't imagine that there was something that could have enraged this animal to act this way. And then, when he was done stomping, he stretched his neck out, and he grabbed hold of what looked to be either a dog or a fox with its teeth. The deer began to shake its head to break off pieces of meat, and it began to consume the small animal. I wish I would have thought to pull out my phone to record it, but that only came to mind when I was talking to a friend from high school later, and he asked me to see the video. I don't know why it never occurred to me to get a video, but I suppose I was too consumed with its strange behavior. I made several trips back to that curve over the weeks, and I saw this monster buck again and again. I made it my mission to get permission to hunt him in the fall of 2021. 
After a look at the courthouse deed records, I knew who owned the land. And when I got to Mr. Lawson's drive, there were six mailboxes all with Lawson stamped on the side. I proceeded to go to each house and ask for Mr. Lawson, the Mr. Lawson who owned the property. I got five doors slammed in my face, and on the sixth, I got no answer. After two weeks and five tries, someone finally answered that last door. The expression on the man's face warned me to tuck tail and run, but I'm stubborn, though, and introduced myself as Sergeant Jeremy. I quickly remembered that I was a civilian now, and I backed up and told him my name. And when he learned that I had recently been discharged from the Marine Corps, his face softened a bit. I'd like to hunt your land, Mr. Lawson, I said. Can I do some work for you around here in exchange for your permission to hunt? The scowl on Mr. Lawson's face turned warm, and he looked down at his boots and he said, There must have been a hundred asked to hunt this ground, and you're the first to ask to work for permission to hunt here. It'd be good to have someone to help around here. How about I take you up on that offer? The deal was finalized, and I would come to the house every Saturday from that day until deer season, or most Saturdays. This was a heck of a deal for Mr. Lawson, but I wanted that deer. This deer was going to go in the record books. The following Saturday, I was there and ready to work, and he had plenty for us to do. We repaired barns, and we moved junk vehicles, and we bush-hogged and mowed fence lines. Mrs. Lawson fixed lunch, and it was perfect. That afternoon, a dump truck deposited a full load of lime in the driveway, and I loaded the spreader for several hours while he spread lime around the house and the barns. Why are you using lime here, Mr. Lawson? I asked. To keep the demons away, he said. Well, I thought he was joking, but I would find out later that he wasn't. Many Saturdays going forward, I would be at the farm, and soon I was invited in for breakfast and dinner as well as lunch. Mrs. Lawson could really cook, and I began to feel as though I was part of the family. I was introduced to the rest of the family that lived on the road, and they were all nice people. And once a month, a friend of Mr. Lawson would visit. He was a Native American gentleman who was called Gray Owl. Gray Owl would arrive and talk privately with Mr. Lawson for a few minutes. After that, he would walk straight to the house and would begin a traditional dance while howling the ancient songs from his tribe. And when he finished, we would meet on the porch. Mrs. Lawson brought out the desserts. Fried pies and ice cream was my favorite. It may seem odd, but I never ask either man the purpose of Gray Owl's performance. Something inside me told me that this was territory that I should not tread, and I didn't. Over the weeks, we replaced fencing all around the property. We cut firewood and collected sap for maple syrup. We pulled cattails from the pond for his cattle to have a better access to the water. On his tractor, we repaired the old trails that had been abandoned over the years. But no matter the job... We never got near the area where I saw that giant buck, and I asked him about that area. We'll worry about that area later, is all he told me. During that time, some strange things happened. We would find dead animals partially eaten randomly around the farm. Some of the animals were his cattle. But the weird thing about all this is that he could have gone out to look for his livestock after dark had they not shown up at the barn on any given night. But he would not go out at night. It's like the man was afraid of the dark. The week before bow season, I told Mr. Lawson that I'd be going into the woods to set up my stand. Trespassers had been a problem at one time and I didn't want him shooting at me. And that's when he finally laid out the rules for hunting his place. I want you to enjoy hunting this land, but you cannot be in those woods during the dark hours. Go in when the sun is up and come out before it sets. 
And last, you were never to hunt that field where you saw that big buck. Do you understand? He said in a serious tone. But that's where I'm going to kill that monster buck, Mr. Lawson, I said. I need you to trust me. There are evil spirits on that side of the land. Now stay away from there. Tell me you hear me. I did all that work through the summer to hunt that area, and now it was off limits. I was disappointed and a little pissed, but it was his land, and I had to abide by his rules. Well, if you say so, I said. This changed my plans. Now I needed to find this buck's travel route so I could catch him either coming or going to the field. I could obey Mr. Lawson's rules and still kill that buck. I just had to find a walk around. It took me 30 minutes to get to my stand on opening morning. I hunted all day, coming out before dark, and I never saw a thing. And throughout the weeks, I saw a few deer, but none were the deer I was hunting. I even moved the stand three times, thinking I was not on the game trail my deer was using but still, he never showed. In early October, after a long day of nothing in the field, I stood on Mr. Lawson's porch eating a piece of Mrs. Lawson's cake. After some chatting, he described the deer I was hunting and he asked if that was the buck I was after. It is, I said. Have you seen him? I know where another buck is on the other side of the farm, he said. Let's move your stand over there. He'll be a wall hanger. Why was he trying to get me off this deer? It made no sense. Mr. Lawson, I've got my mind set on this big one. I even named him Dozer, I said. And once you name one, you got to stay after him. That's a bad move, he said. But I won't try to talk you out of it. Maybe you can learn on your own. Well, what the hell did that mean? He was acting weird and speaking in cryptic tones. What difference did it make to him which deer I harvested? At any rate, I thanked Mrs. Lawson for the dessert and I left. The conversation nagged at me on the drive home. and I had to shake that off and get my head back in this hunt. That deer was mine and I was going to take him. Two weeks later, on Halloween day, I was in my stand at the peak of the rut. Surely, I thought, Dozer would show himself that day, with all the does that I had been seeing. I heard and saw deer all around, but Dozer never showed. And through the day, the sounds went away, and the woods were quiet. They were deathly silent. Maybe I got too comfortable, and I fell asleep. And when I woke, the sun had set. I couldn't see the ground. But the moon was out, and my eyes slowly adjusted so that I could see, and I scrambled down the ladder stand and I headed out. With no flashlight, it was difficult to stay on the trail back to the house. It was a 30-minute walk in daylight, and I figured it would take me 45 minutes to get back. I knew I was halfway back by the landmarks that I could see, and there was a small field to my right when I popped out of the woods. A short distance up the ridge was Mr. Lawson's property line, and a fence divided the properties. On the other side of the fence was another field owned by the Lawson's neighbors, and in this field I saw a fire glowing. I had to check it out. Standing at the fence, I could see a big bonfire burning with people standing around it, Looking closer, I saw the people were wearing black robes and weird face masks. Several were bent at the knee like they were worshipping the fire. The chanting they did was in another language, and it never stopped. It was the creepiest thing I've ever seen to that point in my life. I made myself real small in the brush that lined the fence, and I watched. And The way the light shined on their robes and their silhouettes against the fire were the stuff of a horror movie. I should have left, but my curiosity forbid me from leaving. Panning the area to get a wider field of view of all that was happening, I saw other things that didn't add up, but the most shocking thing of all was the giant buck dozer standing just inside the tree line watching the ritual. 
He began to slowly walk toward the fire, and from the light that shone on his body, he looked like a god from ancient mythology. He was halfway to the fire, and he stood on his hind legs, and they began to change. They grew thicker and became muscular. The chest expanded, and his front legs transformed into arms, hands, and claws, and its muzzle drew back and teeth were now showing. Now, they, they were teeth, but they were fangs. And then that beautiful rack on his head that I coveted for a year grew even larger. And in the space of a 15-yard walk, he changed from a hoofed ruminant mammal to an apex predator. Again, I should have slinked out of there, but I was transfixed on this inhuman ritual and this beast. The group of people around the fire had now formed a circle on one side, and in the middle was who I assumed was the leader. In his hand hung the lifeless body of something. Working quick with a knife, he extended the thing from his hand outward toward the Frankenstein deer, and he plunged the knife in. With one motion, it removed the thing's heart and then held it toward the deer. The crowd began to part while the deer walked into the circle, and it ate the heart in one bite. I hoped the sacrifice had been a pig or something already skinned out, and I prayed it was not a human child. I settled on a pig to keep from vomiting, and I watched the beast chew the heart and the worshippers began to chant again, and I watched. My leg was in a bad position and going numb as I knelt on the rocks, and in shifting my way to get some relief, a rock the size of my hand tumbled down behind me. I heard it, but there was no way they heard it at that distance with all that chanting and the roar of the fire. Well, I was wrong, and when I looked back to the group, Dozer was looking straight at me, and so were the worshippers. Dozer screamed like a freight train, and my ears couldn't take the noise, and I turned and ran. In a flash, I was back on the trail, running like hell. I was heading straight for the Lawson house, and it was ten minutes away at this pace. I dropped all the gear in my hands to lighten my load, and finally I shed my backpack. And I was doing this while running full speed with no light on a trail that, thankfully, I knew well. The only gear left on my body was a K-bar knife, and I pulled it and I held it tightly. It was my only defense if this thing followed, and it did follow. I could hear it pacing me to my right and up the ridge, the leaves crunching as it ran, and in my mind this thing would drop down and attack any minute, but I wasn't going down without a fight. In front of me, a fence that bordered the field was coming up, and I had stepped over it a hundred times, but this time I was jumping. Whatever was chasing me was making its move, and I could hear it getting closer. It was coming down off the ridge and going to catch me before I hit the field. There was the fence, barely discernible in the dark, but I could see it, and three feet in front of it, I launched myself into the air and I sailed over. And at the last second, I twisted my body, landing on my shoulder, and then rolling back to my feet with the momentum of the jump, and I was running full speed once again. There were noises behind me, and I knew the creature had cleared the woods and the fence, but still I didn't turn around to see. I poured on the steam, and then something swished behind me. It was reaching for me. It was right there. I wasn't going to outrun it. The second swish connected with my back. It pushed me forward from the swipe of its arm, and the knives dug into my back. Pain ran from my shoulder to my hip, and I felt my shirt in tatters. Quickly, I rolled to my back and I held the K-bar in front of me. If I was going to die, this thing was going to pay a price. I could see its grotesque figure in the pale moonlight. It towered over me and there was no way out. I started to stand up so I could fight, and when I got to my feet, 
the thing screamed like it had before. The noise was so painful that I collapsed holding my ears. And in the middle of all this madness, I saw lights shining on the creature. And I knew right away they were vehicle lights. And then I heard rifle shots. I looked to the beast and I saw rounds striking it in the chest and head. And I laid back down and got really small. It would be a hell of a thing to survive this creature's attack only to die by a bullet from someone's rifle. Finally, the shooting stopped and the beast was not there. My head pounded from the screech and I lay there covering my head. I couldn't move. In the light of the vehicles, I saw boots walking toward me. Small rolls of dust rolled out from the soles of each step. Hands grabbed my shirt and I was lifted to my feet. And there was Mr. Lawson's face and several from his family. And they all smiled back at me. I looked back to where the creature was and I saw no dead animal, no blood, nothing killed from the accurate fire from my saviors. But in the light from the trucks, I saw lime scattered about in the field. The last thing I saw before I passed out was Gray Owl dancing and chanting over the spot where the beast had stood. He scattered dust from his hands as his song echoed into the night woods, like he wanted someone to hear them. And then the blackness overtook me. He's waking up, I heard Mrs. Lawson say. I opened my eyes to see her walking into another room while Mr. Lawson took her place at my bedside. His hand pushed me back to my stomach when I tried to get up. You have a nasty wound on your back, he said. My wife has ointment on it. And that's what you're smelling. Stay still and rest. Where am I? You're in one of our spare bedrooms, and you've been out for a whole day. I think you're going to be fine, but you have to allow your wounds to heal. She's cooking for you now. When she brings the food, we'll sit you up. I relaxed and became still again. The odors from the kitchen ignited my appetite. Next, I was sitting up eating hot buttery biscuits smothered in gravy, and I ate it like a starving man. Outside, I could hear Gray Owl singing his song. He was moving around the house. The song would be loud and then fade away again. What time is it? I need to get to work, I said. Don't worry about that. I talked to your family and your boss and told them you were helping me for the week. They're okay with that, said Mr. Lawson. Thanks, I said. What happened to me in the field? When you didn't show up at dark, I knew something was wrong. I called the family in to help. We couldn't go out to get you. That would have been suicide. We prayed you could get back to us, so we waited. Gray Owl ventured out as far into the field as he dared to place the boundary. If you reached that, well, at least that gave you a fighting chance. And you got there at the exact moment the Wendigo caught up to you. A Wendigo? I asked. I'll get to that in a minute, he said. How does lime play into this whole thing? I asked. You know, I really don't know. Gray Owl discovered that by accident years ago. But before that, the techniques his people used to protect themselves were less effective. The native people have been dealing with these demons for centuries. But it's not just the lime. That stuff has to be blessed by the spirits to have the full effect. That scream you heard before we started shooting, it was caused by the lime, not our bullets. Anyway, my family, going back four generations, as well as Gray Owl's family and people, have learned to deal with these demons. We have become quite proficient at it. Well, why didn't you tell me about this before, I asked. Because you wouldn't have believed me. Think about that. We had to let you learn on your own. I know that seems cruel, but it's the only way. Mr. Lawson hung his head as if he were ashamed, but I knew he was right. Well, do you have the creature's corpse? You hit that thing with several rounds. No, they can't be killed by conventional bullets. The shooting was only to drive it off so we could get to you. 
It's still out there, and it's in the form of that big buck you've been so hot on. According to Grey Owl, that deer was once a human. It shapeshifted into this creature, and it never went back to its human form. It's just something we live with. I could see that Mr. Lawson was done talking about this, and so I left it there. Well, thanks for coming to get me, Mr. Lawson. I owe you, I said. You just come visit when you can. My wife has grown fond of you, and so have I, he said. By this time, I was ready to get up and move around. My wounds were painful, but I was able to gather my things and drive home. Before I left, Mr. Lawson said something I didn't believe, but would in later years discover was true. That wound on your back, that's the mark of the Wendigo. You're marked for life. Wherever you go now, they will scent you and they'll come after you. Be cautious from now on while you're alone in remote places. They won't bother you in populated areas, so you're safe in town. But they will hunt you in the remote areas. That's where they live. And then Mr. Lawson unbuttoned his shirt and pulled his right shirt sleeve off. A huge scar ran down his shoulder and across his stomach. He was marked just like I was, and that's when I knew to remember his words. My life went on, but my hunting days were over. I would never go close to the woods alone. Almost a year later, my worries were confirmed. I was invited to a cabin in a state park by some friends who were throwing a party. I might have been the last person to show up because vehicles were parked all over the area. I was happy to be in a place away from town. I dropped out of my truck and I was halfway to the cabin when that familiar screech rang out across the lake on which the cabin sat. The sound was so familiar as if I had heard it the day before. I stood there in that gravel drive and I accepted the fate dealt me by the most evil spirits that exist. I could never go anywhere away from a populated area without this happening. Feeling defeated and discouraged, I walked back to my truck and I left. I still see the Lawsons at church and occasionally in town. Mrs. Lawson sometimes drops dessert off to my family. They're good people, living with a torment that may never end. I live my life within a 20-mile radius of my home. I stay in town, around people. Sometimes I wonder if it was all a dream or out of a horror movie. Am I insane and imagining all this? Looking at my back in the mirror, though, confirms that it really did happen. This whole thing wears on my mental state. But so far, ten years later, I seem to be coping well. I'm left with the regret of ever seeing that big buck dozer in Mr. Lawson's field. But now, I'm looking for a way to kill these entities. Nothing can live forever. That includes a Wendigo. I will find a way, and if I can kill it, I may have found a new calling in my life.